with you this morning and to come together to worship God, our Father. If you would, uh, let's go ahead and get seated. There are handouts. They are out at the front desk. For those who didn't grab any, uh, feel free to get up and go grab one or ask someone to grab one for you. I'll be using primarily that first page with the outline, so it will be helpful to have. But let me begin with prayer, and then we'll jump into the lesson today. Our righteous and heavenly Father, we are gathered here according to your will this morning, rejoicing in Christ Jesus, and come to you with thanksgiving asking that you would uh, continue to grant grace that we might grow in the knowledge of your salvation, the knowledge of yourself, the Son, and the Spirit. I pray that this theology of union with Christ would be rooted and grounded in Scripture and that you would help us to, by the Spirit, apply this doctrine to our lives as Paul does to Corinth. And then in continuing with the rest of the Bible, please help us to apply this doctrine. Amen. So this morning we are moving on to the book of 1 Corinthians. And our focus is union with Christ in the book of 1 Corinthians uh, if you have the handout, thus far we've been through the Old Testament and then started to work through the New Testament, and we've come now to 1 Corinthians. And what are the three major aspects or themes that we've seen so far kind of running through the Old Testament and then we saw in the, er, the, New, the New Testament thus far? Who can remember one or more of those three main categories or themes that we've seen with reference to union with Christ. And I'll give you a hint if, if someone needs it, but Pastor Michael? Incorporation, identification, and the, I think there's one more, but I can't remember. Uh, Pam said it, participation. Thank you very much, brother and sister. Yes, uh, so if you'll remember that we have seen union with Christ in the, the perspective of identification. God associates and identifies with his people and thereby they gain their identity. He draws near in, in salvation because there is no... Uh, peace with God until the enmity that began in the garden is dealt with. So we know that in that identification where God comes to his people in, in truth and in uh, spirit, it's salvific. And union with Christ was foreshadowed in the Old Testament with Israel, how God dwelt with Israel. He came to Israel. He dwelt in the tabernacle. He had a sacrificial system by which they could continue to draw near to him. Uh, then we remember seeing um, incorporation. So this God drawing near to us and identifying with us and thereby we getting the identity of saints, believers, Christians. It doesn't just stop with us individually. It's a corporate thing. It's a body of people. Like with Israel, it was a specific, exclusive, defined group of people. And in the New Testament, believers are defined by God as those whom he identifies with, and they are incorporated into his body. And we remember looking at how Christ is the head of this new creation that we are. God deals with us as he dealt with Adam. So why do we all fall? Why are we all cursed? Because we had a particular relationship to God in Adam. 
Adam was our head and our representative. What he did when he sinned has effects for us all. And there, uh, there was an incorporate effect upon that group of people. Well, being incorporated into the body of Christ, it's because of what God has done with Christ as our head and what Christ has done on our behalf. So we're made partakers and members of the body of Christ. And then we saw, too, this theme of participation. So it's not merely a once and for um, I should say once and for all. It is once and for all. But it's not a instantaneous point in time that something occurs only, and then there's no effects. No, when we are incorporated into the body of Christ, we participate in all the benefits that Christ has obtained by his perfect work. And we in our lives and in redemptive history participate in God's uh, redemption. And you can see that with Israel, how we saw that in Old Testament foreshadowed, how Israel was redeemed from Egypt and then they were... The Red Sea was parted. They were, they, God took them through the Red Sea. God took them out into the wilderness, gave them water, gave them food, gave them shelter. He gave them the tabernacle system. He made them holy. He disciplined them. Uh, so we can see that even in the foreshadow that there's this participation. And it's the same for us, uh, more so because what we participate in is eternal. But now in 1 Corinthians, uh, let's look what we can find out more about in 1 Corinthians, about union with Christ. And if you look on your handout, that first uh, major question in gray, how does the book of 1 Corinthians reveal union with Christ? That's what we're wanting to survey, touch on. I say that because even though I'm teaching on it, the time we have is we're only going to be able to hit on some key places. And then when we do, we're not even be able to go very much in depth. So there's always room for study. That's why there's questions here. There's a whole question section that will get you deeper into it in Corinthians. There's uh, scripture memorization. Um, and I didn't organize this outline according to uh, identification, incorporation, and participation. I could have done that, and we could do that throughout all of the New Testament studies. Um, the reason why I did not is, even though those are major aspects of understanding union, whether it be the, the type with Israel or the reality uh, Christians in Christ, it doesn't encompass all the aspects. It, it doesn't uh, allow you to see nuances. So I've kind of stuck to 1 Corinthians. And we can ask questions about where in here is participation? Where in here is uh, incorporation? Where in here is identification? So that you can see the relationship and those themes in there. Um, but I really want us to look at what's, how union with Christ is getting used in its context. That's why I've got this outline that way. And Corinth, um, I want to read part of this. So, the church in Corinth was founded by Paul on his second missionary journey. As usual, his ministry began in the synagogue where he was assisted by two Jewish believers, Priscilla and Aquila. Um, soon after, Silas and Timothy joined them, and Paul began preaching even more intensely in the synagogue. Most of the Jews resisted, and he left the synagogue not before Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, and his family, and many, many other Corinthians were converted. So Paul was the one God sent there that this church became a church from his ministry. And I wanted to tell you a little bit more about Corinth. Um, the Isthmian Games, one of the two most famous athletic events of that day, were in Corinth. 
and it caused a lot of people traffic. And also, even by pagan standards of its own culture, Corinth became so morally corrupt that its very name became synonymous with debauchery and moral depravity. To Corinthianize came to represent gross immorality and drunken debauchery. So look at 1 Corinthians 6. And verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed. So you can see how Paul's saying they won't inherit the kingdom of God, and that's what you were. So you can get an idea from those lists of sins there a little bit of, of what Corinth was like. Uh, they also had a temple to the goddess Aphrodite, and they had prostitutes, priest, prostitute priestesses that would come down from the temple and offer services to men and foreigners. False religion was rampant there. So that's hopefully to give you an idea, and I think that context helps because what Paul's going to do in 1 Corinthians, it's not written like Romans, where Romans very systematic um, explanation and exhortation of the gospel. Uh, Corinth, though, there's problems happening within the church, and there's questions that they're having where they're writing him a letter and seeking answers to questions. So he's, he's simultaneously getting these questions that reveal their theological problems and practical problems, but he's also hearing reports. If you look in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11, For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by the, those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you, so Paul has, has found out that they're divisive and contentious in the church among other issues. If you go to 1 Corinthians 5, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality, verse 1, among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles. 1 Corinthians 8 Verse 1, now concerning things offered to idols, we know that all have knowledge. Uh, he's been, when he says now concerning, if you go back to 7, verse 1, now concerning the things which you wrote me, when he says now concerning, what he's talking about is what you wrote me about asking, now concerning that, I'm going to answer it. So that's, they had a question about things offered to idols. And 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, they have a major problem with spiritual gifts and how to use them, what their purpose is. That's why that great text about love in 1 Corinthians 13 finds itself sandwiched in between gifts. Spiritual gifts and then tongue and prophecy speaking after. Here in the middle of there is love because they didn't understand the fundamental purpose of the gifts. Okay, so Corinth has some issues. In 1 Corinthians 1, 3, he, he says, I can't refer to you as mature or spiritual, but as to carnal, as to babes. But he says babes in Christ. Okay, so I think that really helps because what we're going to look at is how does... In what ways does Paul, the Apostle Paul, use the theology and doctrine of union with Christ to address and deal with these questions and issues? And in seeing how he um, thinks, how he, the, everything, he's there for as an example. The, the word of God that he's speaking to them, how they ought to think, uh, 
how they ought to believe, how they ought to practice on the basis of these truths. Everything he's saying about union with Christ, we can learn not only what Corinth should have done then, but how we ought to behave. We might not be tempted with Aphrodite's temple priestesses or uh, things sacrificed to idols, but what we can see is how does Paul use doctrine and its application to admonish what principles are at work that we might apply as well. So there's practical use as well than ju- and, and not merely a, an intellectual exercise this morning. Okay, so let's look at it. 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. This is in the section of the letter where he's introducing the letter to them. He, he, he has uh, Paul, so he gives who's writing, and then he says to who he's writing, and that's the point. Verse 2, to the church of God, which is at Corinth. Is that a, a <laughs> that's a local church, by the way. Amen. The Bible shows local churches. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ, Jesus. Called to be saints with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Really, I just wanted you to see here how when you reference, like let's say you reference someone and you say uh, to, let me think of this, to Ron, I'm writing a letter, to the one who works at or work, owns his own business, <laughs> to the, uh, each time I'm saying that, I'm, I'm just saying, that I'm referencing the same person, and I'm just giving identifiers to describe who I'm writing to, and I know that seems irrelevant, but Paul doesn't have irrelevance here. He's, he's writing these things very intentionally. But he says, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. So the church is identified not only as the called out ones, but those who are sanctified in Christ. It's past tense. So this is talking about our definitive sanctification. When we become Christians, we're purified by the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, definitively sanctified and made a new creation in Christ. And because of it, you could word it, he could could have worded it vice versa. He could have said, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, to the church of God, he could have interchanged them because they make up the same people. So when you think of the church, when you think of us, a good way for you to think of us is those who are sanctified in union with Christ. We're not just a a group of people gathering together for a social event. And you can see that in three one, he says, "As to babes in Christ," which I, re- I uh, referenced earlier. So sometimes when you see in Christ, uh, when Paul uses it, he he's it's another way for him to just say Christian to those who are in Christ, the church, you. Um, okay, let's go to 1 Corinthians 4, uh, chapter 1, verses 4 to 8. Still in the introduction here. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus. Does anyone have the ESV? Nobody's ESV? What does that say, Linda? Uh, Can you read that same verse in your version? 
sorry. <clears throat> I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. Yes. So there was something different. I don't know if you caught it, but those last three words in the NKJV is by Christ Jesus. In the ESV, it's in Christ Jesus. And in the Greek, it's uh, epsilon nu, so it's in. In, on, among, but it can't have the instrumental use where we could have translated by. It's not bad, but in is a good translation. And I, and I see that as union with Christ there. It's not merely that God, uh, that Jesus Christ gave grace. It's all, more than that. He has given, the grace has come. The grace of God which was given to you in Christ Jesus. So if you see there, where we ought not to think of grace apart from union with Christ. He goes on in verse 5, that you were enriched in everything, and that bias in the NKJV, I think in the ESV, it's in there. In him. You were enriched in everything in him, in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So they, they have spiritual gifts. They have the, all, all the gifts, and they're using them but they're using them with the wrong motive and in the wrong way, in an in on or, unorderly way, not in love. And instead of Paul saying, I wish you didn't have gifts, he's saying, I thank God that you have these gifts. I thank God concerning you. He's not being hyperbolic. He's genuinely thankful that they have these gifts, that you were enriched in everything by him and in all utterance, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. He's going to go on, though, and correct them, rebuke and correct with those gifts. But what you can see here is, and I believe that's primarily what Paul has in mind, because here he says utterance and all knowledge. So, and then when we look in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 14, we see them using spiritual gifts, particularly the showy ones, like speaking in foreign languages, like interpreting those foreign languages, like prophesying, um, and he's uh, has that in mind, I believe, when he's talking about in all utterance and in all uh, all knowledge. However, where do the spiritual gifts come from, or what is the relationship between the spiritual gifts here and in Christ? Anybody? No one? All right. Uh, if you look in verse 5, that you were enriched in everything by him, in all, knowledge, in all utterance and all knowledge. So wh where are they enriched? It's in him. We ought not to think as well about our gifts being somehow given apart from union with Christ. That's the main point there is that our spiritual gifts are through not only Christ as the cause of them, union with Christ as the cause, but through the instrumentality of union with Christ will receive those gifts. So union with Christ is the cause, is, is why we have spiritual gifts. And union with Christ is the instrument by which we received them. Any questions there? All right. 
Well, let's look at uh, one of the major sections first uh, now, division in the church. And I get that from what we read earlier. In verse 10, you see, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas, or I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. And then he goes on. He says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach. Verse 17. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. That was one of the things in the historical aspect that I was reading on that was very important in that society was gaining prestige, gaining social status. And one of the things since Corinth was large, it was Greek, but it had been Romanized, particularly in Corinth, though the surrounding area stayed Greek in its culture. But they still were heavily influenced by Greek culture. And Greek culture is very big on the way you speak. They had a whole cultural uh, ideology about what is wise and who are the wise ones when they speak and the way they speak. Rhetoric. And if someone saw in society someone rich, someone who spoke well, someone who was of noble lineage, and they said, that right there is esteemable. I want to be well esteemed in their eyes. They would labor to acquire high estimation with that people group. And somebody else might choose this other people group. And what you have is a bunch of people with all this division. And they're all proud of their particular categorical social status. And that's coming into the church with them saying, I'm of Apollos, the one who spoke and is mighty in the scriptures. I'm of Paul. And even those who said, I am of Christ, weren't doing it with the right spirit. So he's correcting them. And he gets into this idea of wisdom. That's the issue, is for them, why are they doing that? Well, they think they're, that it's wise what they're doing because their culture and that the worldly philosophies tell them that they need that wisdom. They need the esteem of, of their countrymen. They need the esteem of their neighbors. And in order to gain it, they need to uh, involve themselves in the wisdom of those and aspire to what's valuable to them. So in 1 Corinthians 1... 30 through 31. Paul says, But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that, it, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Let me go back and read from verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, that there are not many wise according to the flesh. What men consider wise and glorious, sinful men, is not a homeless man. It's not the people that the society is largely rejecting. And for them, it was various things that they esteemed low in value. And there were other things they esteemed high in value. And Paul's saying, look, uh, 
Look at those among you. Look at yourselves, Corinth. Among you, not many wise according to the flesh. Not many mighty. Not many noble are called. There's not a lot of... It's not like God. He's like, look among you. God is not calling all, all the politicians, all the religious leaders, all the rich men, all the rhetorically wise speaking philosophers. Look among you. Do you see many of those? There's not. He says, because God has chosen the foolish things of the world. See, the world considers most of us foolish. Not, not even because we're in Christ, but outside of Christ. When we were just walking in our own sin, we weren't, most of us weren't the, the well-esteemed of the world. But God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. And I don't want to, I know I skipped it because I jumped straight to union with Christ. I want to highlight though that really the, the wisdom Paul hits on before this section is the cross, the message of the cross. In verse 18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And look at what, what is really considered wise. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. That's what's wise, is to know God. And the world doesn't matter if it's our culture or any culture. Throughout history, they're blind and dead in sin and have no wisdom. And all their devices with general revelation and common grace made in the image of God, though defiled, they cannot aspire in their best efforts to knowing God. That's why the cross is powerful to us. Because it's God, through crucifying His Son, His righteous, only begotten Son, that we have come into a union with Christ and we know God and therefore have the wisdom of God. And He says there, of Him you are in Christ Jesus, in verse 30, who became for us wisdom from God, Jesus Christ, we are in Christ, and He became for us wisdom from God. And uh, uh, some people say that, that the next three categorical things, righteous sanctification, redemption, are just uh, kind of like uh, details of what that wisdom meant. Others say, no, it's the fruit of God's wisdom. It's very clear they're related. And... I don't know that it really like confuses it to go one way or the other, though I see them as what Paul means when he says wisdom from God, because he's saying, who became for us wisdom from God. Well, what is that? Righteousness. That's what the world doesn't have. The, let the disputer of this age stand up and declare himself righteous. Let him go before God on judgment day when God marks iniquities and say, I'm good. You, he will be put to shame and, and to everlasting contempt and be discovered and displayed before all the eyes that he was a fool. And we're no different apart from God's mercy. And not only do we have a right standing with God, we have a positional, uh, uh, we have positional st a state of righteousness where we're justified, but we also have sanctification. And I know when we hear sanctification, we normally immediately think about progressive. Uh, all of us are progressively being sanctified. And yes, in Christ, 
we are sanctified. And that's right here uh, on the, what does confession say? But I, I believe that the emphasis here is the state, all these as a state. So I think this is again for our definitive, but it would expand into progressive and the end, consummative sanctification. And then redemption, which is a redeeming, a being bought out of the, of the bondage and slave market of sin. Liberated. You can't have the word redemption without the, the idea of slavery. So we were slaves to our sin and we were redeemed. Where, can the world get that? The rich can't buy it. The wise can't attain to it. The Go on, you know. The strong, those who have a lot of power, whether it be individual or national. So, we are in Christ, and therefore, He is to us wisdom from God, and in Christ, we have righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3 is still dealing with divisions. Paul is still dealing with that through all this section. If you look in 3 verses 4, for when, he, when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? So you can see he's still on divisions here. And it, he continues to go on. Um, in, into chapter 4 with this. But in, ver, in chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, he says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. It doesn't anywhere say there specifically in Christ. But we see this uh, illustration and explanation of this reality that we are the temple of God, the Spirit, God dwelling like similar to how God dwelt in the tabernacle in the wilderness, which was patterned after this reality that we are partaking in. God dwells with us like his Shekinah glory dwelt in a building. And that, I know we can look at it later in 1 Corinthians 12, that our union into the body of Christ is by being Im immersed into the Spirit, is drinking of the Spirit. So the Spirit, when I see Spirit, I think union with Christ. And here he's saying, if anyone defiles the temple, the spirit of, uh, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? There's union with Christ by the dwelling of the spirit or the spirit of God. If anyone defiles the temple of God, well, that's you. That's me. That's Corinth, that's Corinthian believers. God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So we know that there's no fear of condemnation. Romans 8, uh, 1 John, I think 4, uh, perfect love casts out fear, and he's talking about the final judgment there. So this destruction here... Um, doesn't mean that they can lose their salvation. But he is warning them. And if you think about the way that God caused his temple, physical temple with Israel to be destroyed due to their sin, Paul's now using that historical work of God's judgment to remind believers that you are the temple of God. You are holy. And remember how God dealt with the children of Israel when they defiled his temple. 
You, I'm warning you with your divisions that you do not defile the temple of God, which is you. That warning is intended with a forward look that they maintain fidelity to the Lord. They maintain a a dependence upon Him and that they humble themselves and stop fighting. And all those whom God has selected, called, will heed that warning. He will preserve His people to heed His warnings. It's the unbeliever that won't heed it. They went out from us because they were not of us. So you can see there in union with Christ that it's as if we're like a temple and God is dwelling in us for an illustration. But it has implications. You see how it has implications dealing with their sin? You see how he's applying union with Christ? He's, he's thinking, you're practicing divisions and picking up worldly wisdom and defiling God's temple. That's significant because God in union with Christ dwells in you. And God will not just stand idly by. That's like a way for us to think, man, I need to be considered about how I'm using my life, how I'm using my body. God dwells in me. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 to 17, is the you there singular or plural? I don't know. Because to... I'm reading in, well, kind of reading in Spanish, and it's using uh, vosotros. Oh, like a, a plural? Yeah, like a plural. Oh, amen. amen. All right. Well, let's go to the next section. Any other questions there? Okay. Let's go to sexual immorality in the church. 1 Corinthians... Six, And I'll I'll start at verse 12 and read to 20. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I'll not be brought under the power of any. Foods are for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual morality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So, the Corinthians were practicing at some level, some members were involved in sexual immorality. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there was some incest happening. Here, he just says sexual immorality. And one of their uh, ways of thinking about their bodies that in their mind justified sexual immorality was all things are lawful for me. God made food 
to feed my stomach's appetites. And in the same way, Paul, God, God made sexually available people to fulfill my sexual desires. That was their thinking. Foods are for the stomach, the stomach for foods. It's just the natural desire that I have that God gave me and he gave me the people to fulfill it with. That's, and look at how Paul's addressing it. Like, if you're going to counsel somebody in sexual immorality, do you think like this? We need to, we need to grow and think and meditate and um, have a mind like Christ. And what is Paul saying? Well, all things are not helpful. So your your all things are lawful for me has got to stop somewhere. And you know what? It's not helpful, first of all. And all things are lawful for me. He says, but I'll not be brought under the power of any. So you're in bondage. Foods are for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God's going to destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. So, and the body and the Lord for the body. And he's talking about not the body of Christ. He's talking about the flesh and blood, body, bones and blood and heart and lungs and brain. This body, my physical body, is for the Lord. And the Lord is for the body and what he does through it. God both raised up the Lord and he will also raise us up. So if, we're, if our souls and bodies are redeemed, why would we think that we can categorically separate spirit and body and say, my spirit's pure, but my body is doing all this other stuff. It's going to die and decay. Well, Paul's saying, Jesus is going to be resurrected or he, I mean, he has been resurrected. You're going to be resurrected. Your body, in other words, Jesus Christ has redeemed not only your soul, but your body. It's the Lord's. So in this text here, our, we need to, in union with Christ, remember that our bodies are members of Christ. So in, un, in our doctrine of union with Christ, it's not merely spiritual. It's physical. Look at our own uh, confession. Or no, it's a, it's a catechism question. Uh, verse 40, what benefits do believers receive from Christ at their death? So this is when a, a believer dies today. There's, the souls of believers are at their death made perfect in holiness. And do not immediate, and do immediately pass into glory. And their bodies, being still united to Christ, do rest in their graves till the resurrection. So in our theology of union with Christ, we need to remember my body is united to Christ. What I do with my body is what God paid for in the blood of his son. And I need to consider what I'm doing with my body. And then he gives that analogy of the harlot. So if I'm in union with Christ, the two shall become one. And then I go and use my body in sexual immorality. What am I implicating upon the Lord? That's Paul's argument. He says, Do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. You know, shall I take then the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? So you can see how he's, he's got a wealth of under, uh, understanding given to him by God and applicable doctrine 
to call people not only to flee sexual morality and stop committing this sin, but do so on this basis. And that's, that's very important. Let's go to the resurrection. Because we're, if, if we get done with the resurrection in time, we'll go back up to one of the former ones. Yes. I just wanted to make a comment. So, and he doesn't do that for no reason. Like, um, call them to purity on this basis. That is really the real efficacious means of purity. You know, anybody who has walked with the Lord for any time, if you try to mortify the deeds of the flesh by carnal means, you will do so to no avail. And really it is, you know, union with Christ, the power of the Spirit, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, reckoning yourself as being dead to sin and united to Christ, alive in Christ Jesus, is really the effectual means that will help us to be pure. Amen. The last point, uh, so I'm skipping Christian liberty and also spiritual gifts. The Christian liberty there is when Paul goes into um, partaking of the food at the altar, partaking in the worship of demons, and how we need to be considerate or uh, be warned that what we do with false worship is, is a partaking with worship of demons and not partake in it. Um, because we partake of the Lord's table and we are in communion with him. Uh, spiritual gifts, and there's a really good text on how we're one body in Christ, but we're made up of a lot of members. Christ is the head, we're a bunch of members, and why would you ever mistreat various members, even in our own physical bodies? The, the more modest members of our body, the the party parts that we don't use as much, but we cover up, we still care for. And we even care for often more than we care for this. I might not care a lot with my hands. That's hitting around everything. But there are other things that I don't really use that I care a lot about. You know what I'm saying by that? And Paul gives that analogy in there. He says, if you start to think about union with Christ, how we're members of one body, and there are some that have more showy gifts than others. Remember that even in the way you treat your own body, you take care of those more modest members. You actually give them more esteem. Why would you not do that in the church? Why would you mistreat one another and all be fighting for these showy gifts? 1 Corinthians 15, 16. Fifteen, sixteen. There was uh, the idea and teaching having an effect upon them that there is no resurrection. And then Paul's addressing that. And he says, for if, in verse 16, if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And so in his mind, okay, if it's true that the dead don't rise because of union with Christ, that means Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile or futile. And you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ that means falling asleep means died. So you know those people in the church that died? He says if there is no resurrection, then they've actually perished eternally. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. So he's just doing the counter argument to say, Okay, if there's no resurrection, then everything we believe is, is 
um, reveals us to be the most pitiable people in the world. And then he says in verse 20, but now Christ is risen from the dead. And he's become the first fruits of, the fallen asleep, of those who have fallen asleep, those who have died. So Christ's resurrection isn't just evidence of the satisfactory work that he did. It is that. God declared him to be the Son of God with power by the Spirit from the resurrection. But it's also our first fruit. He's our head. It's our first fruits. of We're of the same crop. And what he went through and has done, we're going to go through. So there's great hope that, that we ought to be encouraged by the resurrection of Christ. But there, what I just wanted you to see in verse 18, he says, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. So in his mind, in that whole counter argument, he's saying, well, if Christ hasn't risen, those who died in Christ, they've eternally perished. So you can see how what, what the head goes through and acquires, so to speak, is what those in union with him will acquire. It's inseparable. If, if Christ hasn't risen, then they don't rise. If Christ has risen, they will rise. That's because they're in Christ. And then verse 21 to 23. I'm going to start at 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, and by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. I'll stop there for time's sake. I uh, wanted you to see how like we, were, we heard a sermon by uh, Michael Reeves. And it was a very good sermon. He's just showing how all of God sums up all of humanity in just two identities. In Christ... In Adam. In Adam, in Christ, whichever way you want to start it out. But it's just two. You're either in Adam or you're in Christ. And if you're identified in Adam, you will undergo what Adam earned. If you're in Christ, you will undergo what Christ earned. It doesn't matter what you do when you're when, in Adam. You can work, but you will go through. You will die. He says, in Adam, all die. Even so, in Christ, all shall be made alive. So you can see how that union with Christ is juxtaposed to union with Adam. So when we have a theology of union with Christ, we need to be thinking about what that union with Adam was like and how Adam was patterned after the true man or the uh, perfect man, Jesus Christ, the God-man and learn of the union with Christ from this union with Adam. And there's a lot to be learned from what, the way God dealt with Adam, and, and the, of course the consequences um, aren't what we get with Christ, but the relationship of Adam to the people and the Adam and the covenant, we, we can understand more about what this means with Christ fulfilling the terms of the covenant and our union with him in it receiving life. So those are some aspects of union with Christ. Um, if you will, as we go along these, next week will be 2 Corinthians. Uh, feel free to do these studies, but just know that right now we're just trying to sponge up by God's grace what we can get from each book as we get there. We're, we're not taking the big view and trying to understand it all right now. We're just wanting to grasp what's key in each book. And then there'll come a time when we try to give a more systematic definition. Any questions? Okay. Well, let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to um, grow in our belief, this faith you've given us, of the reality that we are in union with Christ and that the doctrine coming from your word would inform our understanding and that we would grow in wisdom and apply it in our lives. 
Thank you for uh, giving us the book of Corinth, uh, 1 Corinthians and helping us to see the, the truth of the new covenant and our union with Christ and how that applies to our life. Um, I pray that our worship also would be pleasing in your sight today by faith. Amen.